Hi boys and girls, welcome to Money and Banana's Learning and Playing Channel. Today I'm going to do Money and Banana's Learning Channel. And today I'm going to read my weird school fast facts, explorers, presidents, and toilets. But this is actually going to be part three, and it is by Dan Goodman, pictures by Jim Pilot. And actually, I forgot to say something also, and it says a million hundred weird facts about U.S. history. Okay. Well, let's start. I was actually on, I left on page 82. Okay. And our next chapter is chapter six, A Few Founding Fathers Fast Facts. The Founding Fathers weren't just a bunch of old farts you see on dollar bills and coins. They were real people who worked together to create a, the United States of America. But I'll bet you didn't know that John Adams was overweight and people call him his retinity. He was the first president to live in the White House, too. But he lost his bid for a re-election and had to move out for four months later. Ben Franklin invented swim fins. That's right. When he was a kid, he attached wooden planks to his hands and feet to help him swim faster. So right here, this um, it's, a, um, it's actually John Adams right here. So you can see the picture more closer. There. And over here, I forgot to read something also. It says, he should have gone on Weight Watchers. It worked for my mom. Huh, that's funny. Not only that, but he also used to sit around with no clothes on. That's not a joke. Most mommings, before he began work, Franklin took what he called an air bath. He'd sit around naked. Hmm, I wonder if he wore his wind fins. James Madison's face is on the $5,000 bill. That's right. There's a $5,000 bill. Can you imagine going into a store to buy a candy bar and asking if they'll get you change for a $5,000 bill? And this is the bill right here. Wow. George Washington was rich in land, but not in money. When he became president of the United States, he had to borrow money from a friend to make the trip to New York City for his inauguration. Okay, next page. Washington also read hunting dogs. And he gave them names like Tartar, True Love, Sweet Lips, Dunk Ard, Drunk Ard, and Tipsy. And then there's Thomas Jefferson. He was the first president who had a pet that lived in the White House. Dick, a mockingbird. Sorry, a, a mockingbird. Dick would stay on Jeff's shoulder, Jefferson's shoulder, as he worked on his in his office. Jefferson would also put food be between his lips and let Dick swoop down and take it. When Jefferson took out his violin and started playing, Dick would sing along. That was just weird. Jefferson wrote this inscription for his own gravestone. Here was buried Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of American Independence of the Statue of Virginia for Religious Freedom and father of the University of Virginia. The weird thing is that he never mentioned he was also President of the United States. Jefferson had some 40 million year old mastodon bones sent to him at the White House. He laid the bones out in the East Room and tried to build a skeleton out of them. The Founding Fathers were weird. Well, that's kind of true. Okay. Chapter 7. It's getting bigger. North America is big, almost as soon as our country was born. 
People realized it was a very cold place and they wanted to spread across the continent. In 1803, President Thomas Jefferson doubled the size of America with one stroke of a pen when he bought the Louisiana Territory from France. It cost $15 million. That's a lot of money, but look what he got for it. The area that's now Arkansas, Missouri, Iowa, Oklahoma, Can- Kansas, Sorry, Arkansas, Missouri, Iowa, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, and parts of Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, New Mexico, Texas. Well, you know I live in Texas, guys. I live in McAllen, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, and Louisiana. The fun thing is, Jefferson had no idea what he paid for. It was like... When you don't know which cards you got until you open it up, so Jefferson sent two explorers, Mary Weather Lewis and William Clark, William Clark, to find out what he bought. On May 14, 1804, Lewis and Clark left St. Louis, Missouri, and headed west. It wasn't easy. Remember, there were no hotels back then. They sleep outside. There were no restaurants along the way where they could stop and eat. There were no roads or highways. No nothing. Lewis and Clark were exploring the wilderness. But then they got lucky. In November, in what we now call North Dakota, they met a Native American woman named Sacagua. She joined the expedition, traveling thousands of miles while carrying her newborn son on her back. Sekigua Gaiwa, I can't really say that, served as Louis and Clark's guide, interpreter, and negotiator. Who knows what might have happened to them if she hadn't been around to help out. Finally, in November 1805, the expedition reached the Pacific Ocean and headed east again. They didn't make it back to Sacagawea's village until August 1806. And do you know how much she was paid for all the work she'd done? Nothing. And she didn't get any frequent flyer miles either. Totally not fair. But in 2000, the U.S. Mint issued a dollar coin with Sakaguas and her baby son's faces on it. A lot of good that did her. She died in 1812. Immigration. If you live in the United States, somebody in your family was an immigrant. We're all immigrants. Well, I do live in the United States. I don't know if I have immigrants in my family. It says, like, somebody in your family, so maybe that's, like, every, to every person. It's not like a maybe. Maybe it's to every person, I think. Maybe your distant relatives walking over a land bridge from Asia to Alaska during the last ice age. When the ice melted, the land bridge disappeared and those immigrants settled all over North and South America. Maybe your family arrived in New England from England during the first great migration, 1630 through 1640, or maybe they lived in one of the original 13 colonies. Maybe they came from Italy, Italy, Sweden, or Germany. Maybe they came from France and settled in Louisiana. Or they ran away from Ireland during the Irish potato famine in the 1840s. Maybe they came from China during the 1849 California Gold Rush. Hardly any of them found gold, but they became farmers or fishermen. Or they built the railroads or opened up a laundry. Maybe they came from Poland or Russia, Central America, or Spain. People came to the United States from all over the world for lots of reasons. 
They were poor and hungry. They wanted to practice their religion freely, or they wanted to be free to speak their minds. People in other countries were hearing about America and this new form of government, where people could vote for their own leaders. They wanted to come here too. Too, waves of immigrants started arriving from all over the world. They all hoped for freedom, opportunity, and a better life. From 1840 to 1940, nearly 40 million immigrants arrived in the United States, most sailing past the Statue of Liberty and through the processing center at Ellis Land. America became a nation of immigrants, and that made us who we are as a country. Okay, let me show this to you right here, and it says. The Statue of Liberty was a symbol of hope for many immigrants coming to America, and this is the Statue of Liberty. Okay, it wasn't easy being a poor immigrant coming to America. Many people came over in big float ships and had to stay in a dark room in the bottom of the ship. A hundred and fifty people would be crowded together. With very little food, and not enough fresh water to drink and wash, they had to use a bucket in the corner for a bathroom jug, and they had to live like that for the for the month or so it took to get he here. New immigrants had to pass lots of tests to enter the United States. Parents had to be healthy and able to work. One examination everyone hated was the one to make sure they didn't have contagious eye infections. Examiners turned people's eyelids inside out with small metal hooks. Ouch! People who were sick got chalk markers on their backs. If there was no cure for the illness, they would be sent back where they came from. And of course, when a large group of people came here because they had no choice, they were th thrown onto ships in Africa and forced to go to America to become slaves. In eighteen, sorry, in sixteen eighty, there were about seven thousand African slaves in America. Let me show you this picture. Okay, so we have the man right here. Signing and all these people. Ooh, even a kid right here standing. Well, the only kid in the picture, actually. Okay, almost done with this chapter. By seventeen ninety, there were seven hundred thousand. They had the hardest time of all. I can't even make any jokes about that. It just isn't funny. Okay. Chapter Eight: Rise of the Machines. All those people coming to America needed to find work, and it just so happened there was plenty of work to do, thanks to this little thing that started in the eighteen hundreds called the Industrial Revolution. It was all about machines. Ooh, we already passed page a hundred. Good. You mean like toilets? No, Arlo. Not like toilets. Here's the thing. Before the industrial revolution, most people lived on farms, and when they needed something, they made it themselves by hand. But when machines were invented, things could be mass produced in factories. And people moved to cities where the factories and jobs were. Take clothes for instance. Everybody needs clothes, right? Even Nail the Net Kid needs clothes. Right. Before the Industrial Revolution, people made their clothes at home, and most clothes were made from cotton. But cotton was expensive. Expensive to use because it was filled with these tiny black seeds that had to be picked out one by one. That is until this guy from Massachusetts named Ellie Whitney, Whitney, 
invented the cotton gin in 1794. Wow, let me show you this picture. Look at all of that. I'm going to put it more over here. You see there? That's how it looks like. Okay. He made gin. Isn't that a drink? No, gin is for sh is short for engine. Instead of cleaning for one pound of cotton in a day, with a cotton gin, you could clean 50 pounds. And this British guy named Samuel Slater built a cotton spinning mill next to a river in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Slater's mill used the force of flowing water to power the machinery. It was the first factory of the United States, and it was a big success. There are tons of rivers in New England, so miles popped up everywhere. Soon, there were lots more clothes to buy, and they were cheaper because machines were used to make the cloth. Farming improved, too. In 1831, Cyrus McCormick, McCormick from Virginia invented a me mechanical re reappear, and farmers didn't have to cut wheat by hand anymore. They could harvest it much faster. Factories could produce more food. The only problem was that all these factories had to be next to rivers. That is, until the steam engine came along. This guy from Scotland named James Watt built a machine that could burn coal. Which boiled water and created steam. The steam engine could power factories anywhere. Not only that, but it could power locomotives and ships. America was on the move. Wasn't the industrial re revolutionary sorry, revolution wonderful, Arlo? Well, I'm going to show you the picture, so I'm going to put it more closer so you can see. I'm going to put it over here. And this is the steam locomotive right here. And over here, this is the watch steam engine. Well, that's cool. Okay. Well, yeah, if you don't mention that factory led to the rise of sweet shops. Do you know what a sweet shop is? It's a factory that makes sweat, so it has the perfect name. Yuck. Sweet shops didn't make a sweet, dumb head. They were factories where people had to work long hours in tiny, noisy, dirty rooms. Sometimes with no windows. I knew that. It sounds horrible. It was. And people lived in overcrowded apartments. There was pollution from burning all that coal. Diseases spread easily. Don't forget about the rats. Newspapers were full of rat stories and reports of rats as big as dogs. Gross. But here's the worst part. They had kicked working in a lot of those factories. In 1820, half of the industrial workers in the United States were children under the age of 10. Some of them worked 12 hours, hour days, six days a week. Some of the jobs and walked working with dangerous machines. So this is a picture of three rats. And over here they says like as big as dogs. Wow. Just imagining one. Okay. And they hardly earned any money at all. It wasn't until 1938 that laws went into effect so that kids couldn't... Mm, couldn't work in factories. 
Okay. Well, this is the picture. It says, "Children at the Kindergarten Factory in High Point, NC, nineteen twelve." I think I'm not sure if it's New York City. Not sure. No, I think it's North Carolina. Okay. Here's a cute story, Arlo. Single woman. They worked. Who worked in factories had a hard time finding husbands, so they started hiding notes in the men's clo- clothing they were making. They wrote things like, "I hope you will be well pleased with this hat. If you have a few minutes time, please write and tell me how you like your hat." Of course, you must be a single man, as I am a single girl. It was like a day dating service at one factory in Pennsylvania. Twelve women found husbands this way. The Industrial Revolution created a lot of jobs, but it also took away a lot of jobs. Machines could do things that people used to do. Or in some ca- in some cases, horses and moles used to do. Some craftsmen, sorry, some craftsmen saw their jobs wiped out of by the new machines. Hmm. Maybe I'll start leaving little notes in Arlo's clothes. Did you ever hear of the Luditz, Arlo? Of course. Everybody knows about the Luditz. I know everything there is to know about the Luditz. Who were the Luditz, Arlo? Uh, they were this group of people. Yes, and they did this thing. Arlo, you have no idea who the Luditz were, do you? No clue. The Luditz were a group of English workers who were really angry about machines taking over the yard. Their jobs. This was around eighteen eleven to eighteen seventeen. So they protested, rioted, and even destroyed some of the machines. That wasn't very nice. These days, if someone doesn't like new te- technology, sometimes they're called a lunatic. Well, it didn't matter what those lunatics did. The world wasn't changing it as new and better machines. Were developed. This guy named Alicia Otis invented the elevator, and the next thing anybody knew, skyscrapers were popping up everywhere. Thomas Edison invented the light bulb and lit up the world. Wow! Both good and bad things happened as a result at sorry of the industrial. Revolution. You can't hold back the future. Wow. Okay. Well, this is going to be Chapter Nine: The Civil War. It's sad, but wars are a big part of history. From eighteen sixty one to eighteen sixty five, our country fought one of the bloodiest wars ever. The amazing thing. Was that we didn't even fight against another country. We fought a war against ourselves. It was a civil war. It's complicated, but it pretty much boiled down to some of the states, the South or the Confederacy, wanting to keep slavery in some of the states, the North or the Union. Sorry, the Union, wanting to get rid of it. The Union won the Civil War, and it changed America in many ways. Now, Arlo, I don't want to hear you saying silly things and making inappropriate comments in this chapter. Wars are nothing to joke about. People die in wars. It's not funny. Chill, Andrea. Don't worry. I won't say anything rude. Toilets. 
You're impossible. Anyway, here are some weird facts about the Civil War. I'll go first. The first shots of the Civil War were fired at Fort Sumter, South Carolina, on April twelfth, eighteen sixty-one. On one side was Conf- Confederate General P. G. T. B. Sorry, Beauregard. Beauregard. On the other side was U. S. Major Robert Anderson. The weird thing was that Anderson was Beauregard's teacher when they were both at West Point Military Academy. Wow. General Stone Wall Jackson was injured in the Battle of Chancellorsville and had to have one of his arms amputated. The arm got a proper burial, complete with a head stone. When Jackson eventually died, he was buried over a hundred miles away from his arm. So I guess you could say that he rests in pieces. Get it? Rest in peace. Rest in pieces. That's a joke. Wow. Is that true, or is he just lying? Oh wait, I think I can see what it says right there. It says May three. Is that? I think that's eighteen eighty three. I'm not really sure. Right here. Let me see. Right here. I'm not sure if it's eighteen eighty three and eighteen ninety three or nineteen. Eighty-three. I don't know. Nineteen ninety-three. You know this. Okay. So actually, oops, I didn't finish the page. The man's arm was cut off, Arlo. That's nothing to joke about. Okay, okay. How about this? In eighteen sixty-two, a Virginia farmer gave Confederate General Robert E. Lee a flock of chickens. His men ate all the chickens except one, who survived by making her roost in a tree overhanging Lee's tent. Lee decided that he liked the chicken. He named her Nellie, and she was allowed to go in and out of his tent as she pleased. Then one day, Lee invited some other generals to have dinner with him, but his cook couldn't find enough food to make a meal, so he cooked Nellie. It was the only time in four years that Lee yelled at his cook. During the war, General Lee's Virginia estate was confiscated by the Union and turned into a cemetery. Today, that cemetery is called Arlington National Cemetery. Four hundred thousand people are buried there, including Presidents William H. Taft and John F. Kennedy. After the Battle of Shiloh. Shul- Soldiers on both sides noticed that their wounds glowed in the dark. That must have been weird. As a matter of fact, the glow in the dark wounds seemed to heal better than the others. This mystery wasn't solved until two thousand one, when two Maryland teenagers figured out that the wounded men became hyper. Hypothermic, and their lowered body temperatures made from perfect living conditions for a bacteria that glows in the dark. Abraham Lincoln is remembered as one of our greatest presidents, but he never thought he would become president. When he was running for the Senate in eighteen fifty-eight. Lincoln's wife told him she was convinced he would be president one day. Lincoln told a reporter, "Just think of such a sucker as me as a president." Well, guys, I'm going to stop here. I'm gonna stop on one hundred twenty-one. I'm gonna stop right here, and remember, stay tuned for all the videos that I make for this um book. And also remember, 
from my other videos. And stay tuned for my next videos uh, of my weird school fast facts, explorers, presidents, and toilets. Well, uh, it's time to say bye. And I hope you like all the facts about U.S. history. Well, one, two, three. Bye, everybody. Stay tuned for my next videos. Bye. Hope you like my video. Bye.